Life Trusts in uh, 2024. And this is being run jointly tonight between the Wildlife Trusts and the Soil Association. And of course, we're in Oxford for the first week of the year because it's the time when so many people in the food, farming and nature agenda come to Oxford for the two, not one, but two Oxford Farming Conferences. You have the Oxford Farming Conference that's been running for decades, uh, which was sort of, if you like, you could say perhaps some of the sort of establishment agriculture industry uh, that have been meeting in Oxford in the first week of Oxford for many, many years with that conference. And then I think it was about 20 years ago, the uh, so-called Real Oxford Farming Conference formed uh, as a kind of uh, alternative to the Oxford Farming Conference as well. Meaning it's quite ch tricky for people like me when we're talking about which conference we mean. Do we mean the Real Oxford Farming Conference or do you mean the original Oxford Farming Conference, which some people want to call the real Oxford Farming Conference, but it gets very, very confusing. But anyway, we're here. It's a great time to be in Oxford if you're interested in the food, farming, nature debate. I mean, Oxford is a great place to be at any time, but particularly in the first week of January. And so we thought tonight it would be great to have a discussion around the topic of food versus nature. Is it time to put that debate to bed? And why are we at the Wildlife Trust asking that? It's because over the last couple of years, uh, we've seen this debate really emerge and it be sometimes poised as an either or kind of debate. I mean, for many people, that would seem rather odd. You know, we are ultimately dependent entirely on nature to produce food. That much you would have thought was fairly clear. But actually, quite a lot of times over the last couple of years, we've had commentators suggesting that uh, too much land is being given over to nature, that actually this is going to threaten our food security. Uh, even Manette Batters, uh, president of the NFU over the last year, has said uh, that food security should not be a poor relation to the environment. She said that uh, just in the last year. And just before Christmas, we had other people sort of raising concerns that supposedly our food security was at risk because of the reintroduction of beavers, I kid you not, quite extraordinary. We might get into that a little bit tonight. But anyway, a warm welcome to everyone here in Oxford and a warm welcome to those of you joining us online. We've got a fantastic panel to help us explore this issue tonight. Uh, on my, uh, I was gonna say my far right, but that sounds wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, to the audience's left, let's put it that way, uh, we have James Robinson, Vice Chair of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. Next to me, we have Lucinda Langton, Head of Sustainability at Marks and Spencer. Uh, next to me, this side, we have Steve Proud, who's Land Management Director at Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. And then we have Sarah Langford, who's Barrister, um, Farmer, and Author, I think is what you go by, uh, uh, who's book you might well know called Rooted, a fantastic book. I'll say a little bit more about that tonight. Um, but please, everyone, give a warm welcome to our brilliant panel. So, James, I'm going to start with you, if I can. Um, tell us a little bit more, first of all, about the Nature, uh, nature Friendly Farming Network. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've actually had an upgrade since... You wrote your notes. I'm now the chair of the uh, hey, industry group. Round of um, hey. <laughs> Was that this afternoon or no? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it probably just means a bit more work rather okay. than um, any accolade. But it's uh, yeah, it's a great organisation to be part of. I've been part of the organisation for I think about four years now, something like that, and been on the steering group for the last two or three. Um, and it's a group of farmers that was formed by primarily one of the chaps on the front row here, Martin Lyons, um, who saw this need really for farmers to start driving the change. Um, farmers are best poised to drive that change as well in terms of bringing nature back onto farms and combining this food and, and uh, food and, and nature. And um, it's now got thousands of members. Um, it's free to join, so please get on nffn.org.uk and get joining. Um, and it's, it's great to be a part of that, that movement, really. Everything from lobbying governments to sort of farmer-based change at a farm level, really, and um, advice um, and uh, events and things. And it just is a really good organisation to be part of. So, James, uh, I'd love to hear it from your perspective. I mean, certainly at the Wildlife Trust, we've felt this kind of attempt to 
you know, bifurcate or, or to, to polarise the sort of food versus nature uh, perspectives over the last couple of years. Have you felt that? What's been your experience of how the debate has been framed by some as either uh, one about food or nature? Yeah, I think the more, the more people realise how much farming has depleted nature over the last, you know, it isn't just the last couple of decades, the last 100 years or so, um, and it, the, the, the more that polarisation has become as well. Um, there's certain people, certain organisations, certain groups that want to keep that that distance as well from themselves and, uh, um, and and others. But the NFFN is a great centre ground for bringing everybody together. I think sometimes we need that bit of stretch, though. We need those people that do that do keep, well, not keep it polarised, but keep keep their end, um, try and keep their end sort of specialised, in the word, in, in, into food production. I think it does just challenge us sometimes within that middle middle ground that we are actually doing the right thing, that we're not stretching off one way or the other. But me, on our farm, I love nature, but I love producing food as well. I just love farming. And farming for us is very much, it is the food production, but it's also the care of the land, and it's also the care of the habitats that are there and creation of those habitats and things as well. So we see it all as very much one on our farm. And what would you say to sort of any new farmers joining Nature Friendly Farming Network, uh, people sort of that are moving from perhaps a old-fashioned intensive agricultural kind of space into a more nature-friendly farming space. What do you think are the key lessons, the, the key headlines of, of things to pay attention to? I think everyone's on a certain... There'll be some people that haven't really thought too much or even at all about nature on their farms. They've just done what they've done because they've always done it and because they've been stretched down doing that that way of farming by, you know, by market forces and things. Um, but there is a huge amount of support there for people that are wanting to change and people are going to have to change. We're going to have to look, as, as, as an industry, we're going to have to go down that route because it's, uh, it's, it's a one-way road going just on pure food production and we're never, you know, it, it isn't sustainable long-term anyways. Short-term gain, but really long-term, it isn't, it isn't anything well, we can do. Well, just tease out a little bit more about that. I mean, what you're... Why do you say that's the case? I mean, why, why is it that it's a one-way route down in, in intensive agriculture threatening... Essentially, what you're saying there is it's intensive agriculture is threatening long-term food production. Yeah, I mean, coming down on the train today, the amount of flood in the was, well, flooding for starters, you know, it's... Uh, but the amount of the amount of soil that there was washing down those rivers as well. You know, well, that number one, we're losing that soil and it takes, you know, hundreds of years to put an inch of soil back on. So we must, you know, we'll look after soil number one. That's the... That's the number one goal, I think, as, as farmers, really, to, to maintain that soil and build that soil as well. Right, OK. Um, James, uh, last year we published um, jointly between the Wildlife Trusts and uh, Nature Friendly Farming Network, uh, we published this report, Farming at the Sweet Spot, uh, which I have to say is one of those reports, and so you can find it online, of course, Farming at the Sweet Spot. It's one of these ones that um, I read it, and then I was so astonished by it. I read it again slowly to make sure I'd really got it. Um, it's got some pretty astonishing headlines and conclusions in it, hasn't it? Would you like to tell us a, a bit more about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's, you can sort of broadly, broadly describe it as less is more, really. You know, every farm has its sweet spot, as it would, uh, as it would um, say, and it's um, just focusing on production isn't isn't the most profitable thing. We, you know, I went to college at uh, in Cumbria Newtonry College um, a long time ago in the 90s, and um, it was production, production, production then, and it, and and that is still being taught in colleges now. Um, and but yet, by which is meant production in the short term, to be honest. It is very much yeah. so. So you're looking at you're looking at yields of you know um, day live weight gain of beef or um, kilos of of um, grain per per hectare or whatever. Um, and yet, in reality, that is a real short-term way of thinking again. Short-term for sustainability of, um, of food production in general, but also for your farm as well. And you can be much more profitable if you scale back a bit, if you dial back. If you do this MSO, which um, Chris Clark came well, up MSO with, stands for maximum sustainable output of, of, of your farm. So at any one point, you can work out exactly where that point is, where that sweet spot is. And that is where your farm is most profitable and guaranteed it will be less than what you're probably trying to push your farm to do. So actually what you're saying is if you, if you spend less on all those really expensive inputs, the artificial fertilisers and pesticides and chemicals and so on, that's better for nature, but it's also better for profit and, and could result in 
greater production longer term, maybe not in the first year or two, but longer yeah, Absolutely, term. yeah. And it's a bit like when, you know, so we've converted to organic nearly 20 years ago now, and um, first couple of years really hard, but now we're producing virtually the same as what we were before without those expensive chemical-based fertilisers and things. So, yeah, it's, it's just looking at your farm, really, and seeing what it can produce rather than what you're told it yeah. could potentially produce by putting all these expensive inputs on. And perhaps look, look, paying attention to the inherent capacity of the land. Absolutely. And, and every food. farm is different. You know, yeah. every field within every farm is different. Yeah. And it's about knowing your land, really. Right. OK. And obviously, over the last uh, two, three years, with the uh, particularly the appalling war in Ukraine, that's made a huge difference to the cost of some of those agricultural inputs, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, fertilisers went... I mean, we've, we haven't had to buy any, luckily, for nearly t for 20 years now, but... Um, yeah, I think they touched a thousand pound a ton, whereas in reality and they used to be what they used to be probably um, two two fifty something like that. Um, so obviously that's huge, and that did make people look at their inputs on their farm and what they needed to put on, rather than putting on what their agronomists had told them they should always put on. Um, and that's the thing, really, with farming better, farming with nature, farm you know whether it's uh, regenerative, organic, or nature-friendly farming, however you want to label it. I think it puts farmers back in control. And that's really, I think, is the best thing about farming in that way, really. It stops you being a slave to the big inputs, you know, to the sprays, to the fertilisers, to the feed companies, putting that farmer back in control. Right. Good. Well, James, thank you very much. It's so good to have you on the panel tonight. Um, I'll turn next to Lucinda Langton, Head of Sustainability at Marks & Spencer. Lucinda, thanks so much for joining us tonight. You know, what, what the picture that James has just painted sort of actually sort of suggests in a, in a weird kind of way what might be feel quite paradoxical to some people that actually it's sort of old-fashioned intensive agriculture that, that threatens long-term food security in this country because we're seeing declining soil facility, loss of soils and so on. What, what's the role that retailers uh, that, and a retailer like M&S can play in helping farmers make a transition to more nature-friendly farming? Sure. So um, I've been at MS about two years and I've been lucky enough to inherit Plan A, which is our sustainability plan, because there is no Plan B for the planet, which you probably all have heard of, um, and be the steward of that for food. So I think one of the programmes I'm most proud of is, I totally agree with you, Craig, I think is our Farming with Nature programme. And really what we've done is, is set standards, if you like, very high standards for nature within our farming supply chain in the UK. So with 412 produce suppliers, one of the things we have at m and is a much tighter supply chain than some other retailers. We, we really do know where our food comes from. 95% of it is own label. So we know right down to farm where it's coming from. And, and our Farm With Nature program really has three parts. So the first part is all about leaf mark, asking our, um, asking our farmers to have leaf mark certification and to additionally do two additional m and modules focused on landscape and nature and um, integrated pest management. So how can they use natural pest, um, natural um, beneficial insects to reduce the use of pesticide, et cetera. So we're asking them all to have landscape and nature plans, biodiversity plans effectively, and to have integrated pest management plans. And so that's, if you like, the standards we set. But we know it's tough, and we know that not all farmers have that, have that um, recourse to advice. So that's why we've partnered with the Wildlife Trusts and GWCT, and we have a number of seven grower groups across the UK where farmers, our farmers can come, they can learn, and importantly, they can learn from other farmers. So they can see this work being done on other people's farms and say, oh, did that work? Oh, I might try that then. And, and kind of build a bit of confidence, a bit of... Um, and they also get access through through a lot of the, the great expertise of the Wildlife Trust to things like grants and to understanding where to apply for for those grants. And then the third pillar is around innovation, so really helping farmers... Um, on farm innovate and we have five different indicator farms that we're working with and then sharing the results of those um, innovations across the whole um, produce farming base so it's relatively it's, it's not all farms it's, it's it's all our produce farms the uk based at the moment but we're hoping to roll that out internationally and, and further and across our now livestock with our new farm for the future program as well which is much more to do with with harper adams and and um Again, encouraging nature and biodiversity in our livestock supply chain. So, lots of programs going on. But I really, that's I think is one of the key roles that we as MNS can play is like help bringing, bringing the advice and the and the um, driving the level of importance through our standards. That this is this is key. And, and what are the areas of that sort of transition that you you sense are going sort of better or perhaps more easily than you might have anticipated? And what areas perhaps causing difficulties that weren't anticipated? 
Some of the bits that have been really good, I mean, we've had some brilliant partnerships around innovation. So we're just about to, we've just done, um, trying to measure pollinators, for example, partnering with AgriSound, who are a little box that we've been putting on a couple of farms and we've been listening to wing beats of pollinators. And we've, they worked so well on two farms, we're now rolling that out to a further 18. So really starting to understand measuring how, how the work, the interventions that farmers are doing are, are making a difference and how that measurement, because I mean, as a, as a retailer, we're under pressure from investors to start to disclose more and more of this information. So having simple ways to measure and measure how we're making a difference, that's, I think, going really well. And I know that the farmers really themselves do appreciate the grower groups. We get great feedback. Um, we've run three sets of events. Some on pest management. This year was all about water. And I think that what people are learning now when you know we've got the the flooding outside, as you say, the waterlogged fields. Like, how do you store water? How do you cope with it in these different types of scenarios? You don't have enough in the summer, and you've got too much in the winter. How do we manage it better to create resilience? And I think it's it's the resilience that that people that is going. I think will. We hope it will go well for our farmers in the future to, to help build that resilience. Great, thanks. And what's, what about the communications messaging you've had with consumers, customers around all this? I mean, you know, there's quite complex messages in some of this. Uh, how, do you, how do you go about that? And do you, do you find customers are coming with you on the journey? So, yeah, I think it's interesting. One of our most successful campaigns, I don't know how many of you saw ITV, our campaign on ITV in the summer called Farm to Food Hall six ads with Tom Kerridge. It's the most successful campaign we've run. So customers do come on the journey with us. And once we've aired those, those products on the TV, you know, the stores, the, the shelves are bare the next day. So, you know, it really makes a difference. People want to know the stories and they, and they, we know. So I think one of the biggest roles that we as a retailer can, can take is to tell the stories and to tell the stories of our farmers. And very often if I go to farm, people will say, Oh, you're, we're doing all this work, extra work for MS. You make us go the extra while. You're not telling our stories. Well, that's kind of been my commitment. Is actually we are step changing it, and we are really starting to tell the stories. And I think it's making a big difference. Great, Lucinda. Thank you very much. Uh, there's going to be a really good discussion. I think when we get into the Q and A here, I'll turn next to Steve Proud, who's Land Management Director at Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. Steve, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And um, Steve. We often find at Wildlife Trust, don't we, that it's positioned as a kind of the two extremes of the debate, either full-on rewilding, or as some people might call it, or full-on in intensive uh, agriculture. But I, I know at, at Bebout, you, you know, you're, you're far more engaged in, in looking at integrated land use. You know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How do you, how do you make that work? And what do you mean by integrated land use? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, so at Bebet, we have uh, 85 reserves across three counties, manage about 2,600 hectares of land. Um, I'm lucky enough, I've got a fantastic team of 30 staff. I've got an ecology department, reserves team. Uh, and farming is essential for management of a large proportion of those nature reserves using traditional farming methods for saving natural habitats. Um, so within that team, I have my head of land management for uh, books, uh, was brought up on a farm. Um, from a farming background and has been with us for 18 years. Um, so really connected to the land and understands those, those, uh, the needs and the requirements of the land and that connection to farmers. So we simply couldn't manage our nature reserves without, without farmers uh, and putting livestock on those, farms, uh, those nature reserves in appropriate ways, hay cuts at appropriate times of year. So integrated farming into our nature reserve management is, is essential. And we struggle. We struggle to get the right livestock onto these really difficult sites, uh, whether that be chalk grassland in the Chilterns, whether it be heathland, because these are bits of land that have been challenged farmers for productivity, they've been given up, and nature, you know, they've been allowed to scrub over or inappropriately grazed. So bringing back farming, supporting farmers to graze nature reserves is, is really, really important for us. Um, we do have some small farms. We, in Oxfordshire, we have a, a small 66 hectare farm of which about 30 hectares is tenanted, um, and that is in a agri-environment scheme with, uh, as, as arable. Um, so that's farmed mostly conventionally, but with uh, some fantastic field margins. And we keep that farm as arable because the, the farmland birds and what that, that agri-environment scheme does for farmland birds in that area is really, really important. So we've got a huge spectrum within our, our 2,600 hectares, half of which is tenanted as well. So we're, we're landlord and tenant across that whole spectrum. So we see both sides of the coin, the difficulties for um, tenants, the difficulties for landlords, um, everything, like I say, from conventional farming to habitat creation and nature reserve management. So the full spectrum there. Um, 
it, let's just go back to a point there, though, that I think some people might still find a bit curious or, or might uh, might not fully uh, understand and might want to dig into a bit more. You, you were saying you need to farm some of the nature reserves. Uh, just explain a little bit more why that is, because I think some people would find that confusing. I, I think there's, there's need to farm or we need farmers, um, and we absolutely need farmers uh, to do that, because across three counties, we can't run, as a wildlife trust, a, a, a livestock operation that will feed those 86 dispersed nature reserves. We need local farmers with the appropriate livestock and knowledge to deliver appropriate grazing for those. those cause so I mean, what we're why can't you... Don't worry, I do know the answer to this question. But, <laughs> but, 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 but I mean, just to pull it out, why wouldn't you just let them go wild? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so a lot of our nature has adapted. I mean, we, we cleared our original land 5,000 years plus ago. So a lot of our remaining nature has adapted traditional farming practices. And then what happened with the intensification of farming post-war is that those less productive areas of land, those semi-natural habitats, whether it be heathland, short grassland, some of our floodplain meadows, were, were given up from farming. So we lost productivity off that land. So actually the amount of area of, of land farmed in the UK reduced, but the productivity of the land that was farmed increased. So we've made more food off less land. But by not uh, using these bits of marginal land, uh, they began to scrub over. We had coarse grasses that came in. We lost species from that. So restoring and recreating those farming practices is essential, and especially on some of our biggest reserves here in Oxfordshire, Chimney Meadows. We have 320 hectares there of uh, hay meadow and floodplain, which unsurprisingly will be most underwater right now. Um, but it's essential for those maintenance of those floodplains and those hay meadows that there's an annual hay cut, you know, as would have been traditionally taken, and there's an aftermath graze. You know, and again, as a wildlife trust, we can't possibly manage that. We do have stock. We have 50 cattle, a few hundred sheep. But again, we need farmers to, to deliver those objectives for us. And these sites might be the last vestiges of particular species or whatever, so you can't Ab risk losing those. Absolutely. Yeah. These are the, the strongholds, the jewels and the crown that are remaining from those traditional farming practices that still have got the wildlife there. And really, as, as wildlife trusts and organisations, we're waiting for farming just to reinstate that, those practices on the wider landscape so those species can start to repopulate. You can release them out again. Yeah. Um, now, you also give a lot of advice directly to farmers on, on land, on their own land, don't you? Yeah, so outside my team, we have two other directorates. Uh, we have what we call the wider countryside team. They actively engage farmers looking at projects, so, so demonstrating what can be achieved, what we can do for nature on farms. So we look at projects that we've delivered, whether they can be adapted to deliver uh, on farmers' land. Um, but also we have a consultancy um, that has uh, ecologists and land advisors in there as well. So they're very much helping farmers to uh, discover what's on their land, um, to excite them about the potential for nature's recovery on their land, to advise them where, where the, where's best to put their shoulder to the wheel. You know, there's nothing worse for a farmer, I think, to, you know, be given a piece of advice and, and something not turn up. So there's stuff at the local farm level, but also covering three counties, a strategic level. You know, we've got decades of data, fantastic data set. We know where wildlife used to be. We know where it wants to be. And again, we can provide farmers and uh, farmer clusters that advice and support to know where nature best can be found. Great. All right. Well, Steve, thank you very much. Great to have you joining us on the panel tonight. Um, our last uh, panel member tonight is Sarah Langford, who, as I said, introduced, uh, introduced yourself as a barrister, uh, farmer and author. I might get you to explain Just that. Just greedy, isn't it? Just explain Sorry. that a little bit in a moment, Sarah. But um, her... This is your most recent book, isn't it? Yeah. You're yeah. writing another one at the moment. I promise I didn't pay him to do this, yeah, by the way. No. This is um, uh, this book that was published last year or the year before. I read it last summer. It's called Rooted, How Regenerative Farming Can Change the World. I think it's a fabulous book, and I can't recommend it enough. It really, really opened my eyes. I remember saying to so Q colleagues that, you know, I feel I've been in and around this debate for many years. But when I read this book, you know, bits clicked around it uh, that hadn't previously done so for me. So, Sarah, congratulations on a brilliant book. I and, might pay you now. That's <laughs> and, um, but tell us why you wrote it. And t tell us a little bit about your story. I mean, the whole, the whole story's in there. But um, just give us the sort of headlines about the story. Spoiler alert. Um, well, it was an accident. I was supposed to write a really lucrative crime thriller series. That is what my literary agent really wants me to do uh, because I had written a book about being a criminal barrister which tried to use 
uh, splice a kind of memoir and narrative nonfiction to take people from outside a world that was an impenetrable through, into it through human stories, which I hope is what Rita does, but with agriculture. Um, and while I was writing my first book, my husband lost his job in 2017, and we left London and moved to Suffolk, where he grew up. And because we had two very small kids and were basically unemployed, said to his parents, please, can we take on the running of their farm? His dad, at that point in his early 80s, had realized his long-held ambition to be a farmer and bought 180 acres of arable. And so with the kind of confidence that comes of complete ignorance, said, well, we'll do it. How hard could it be? Uh, and then tripped and fell down this extraordinary rabbit hole, which happened, of course, at exactly the same time that farming in the UK was changing so dramatically for the first time in two generations uh, because of the transition from payments for land to payments for public good. Uh, and my background before the barrister bit was in the, I guess, the world of agriculture and that my grandparents had been Second World, post Second World War tenant farmers in Hampshire. So they had got their tenancy five years after wartime rationing ended when everyone remembered what it was to be hungry. And then my uncle took on their tenancy in the 80s when shortly afterwards he was paid not to farm because surpluses were so high he was paid set aside. So I I put their story into it as one of the memoir chapters because I realized that within my own family story, like I imagine so many of the farmers in Oxford at the moment, you have this extraordinary legacy of hero who fed the nation to within the space of one generation being, as they see it, as many people say, including my uncle, vilified for doing what they've been asked to do whilst also destroying all the rivers decimating wildlife populations, decimating insect populations and bird populations. And what I could see through going to many of the farms, including James's, very glad to have been hosted, even did 5 a.m. milking once, didn't do it the second time, did I? But <laughs> <laughs> was these truly pioneering farmers who had, for multiple reasons, but usually a crisis point, because they just couldn't keep on afford, they couldn't afford to keep on farming the way they're farming, had come up with, when I, I want to say kind of radical solutions, but in all honesty, they're solutions that would have been completely recognizable to their great grandfathers or even their grandfathers. So when we talk about um, kind of modern farming or conventional farming, I just think it's kind of worth remembering. It's only been conventional for, 20, for 70 years out of all of the time that we've been farming. And of course, like bringing it, I guess, back to the title, what all of these farms had in common was that food and nature were not separate. You couldn't do one without the other. And I guess we come into that too. We are part of nature. We just have othered it for a really long time. So we go and look at it, but we don't realize our own interaction with it. And I think that was a massive light bulb moment in so many farms I went to where through adopting practices where they watched the life cycle around them, because they had to rely on it, had to rely on predatory insects and so on, the farmers that I met also realized that they were part of that cycle too. They weren't just driving around in matter machinery spraying stuff. They were absolutely integral to it. So it changed their relationship with everything, with their, with their land, with their family, with themselves. So that's why there's a fairly punchy subtitle on there about how regenerative farming can change the world. Because I think that this way of farming is not just about making food, it's about our own relationship with nature too. Excellent. And so what would you say, what have been the biggest lessons for you and your husband as you've, you've gone on this journey? <sighs> that's a big question, Craig. Um, I think a true realisation, having been in the city for a really long time, that I too was deluded about the idea that food is priced to show its true cost, which of course it's not. And of course we all end up paying for it, just not at the till, just much further down the road. So when you get a uh, chicken that's cheaper than a pint, you don't really think about the fact that you just go for the cheapest chicken. I watch people do it a lot. 
And I think that when you go to these systems and you truly begin to understand that you are what you eat and you are what you eat eats, it comes all the way down the line to where we are with not just our environmental crisis, but our health crisis too. It's all part of the same thing. And I think it's really kind of fascinating that this idea of gut biome is really kind of kicking off in a popular way with like Stephen Bartlett's podcast is doing it, Tim Spector, Tim Lang. But the soil has its own gut biome too. Every rhizosphere around the plant root, that's the plant's gut biome. So if that's not healthy, when we eat the plant, it won't make our own gut biome healthy. So that, the kind of science behind it, I say this identifying firmly as a humanities student, but the science behind it, of course, made massive sense. And I sort of thought, why? You know, I sort of vaguely remember photosynthesis at school, sort of, not really. But that was the key to everything, this idea that plants are producing the food that's going to feed the billions of creatures that live in the soil that are cycling nutrients. And, and very few of us know it, understand it, or understand our own link to it. So look, since you've got that big title, How Regenerative Farming, subtitle, How Regenerative Farming Can Change the World, what for you is the essence of regenerative farming? Well, you can, you can get tied in knots about, you know, keeping the soil covered, having living roots in the ground, integrating livestock. But ultimately, there's a um, farming friend of mine called George Young, and I think he puts it best, which is that fundamentally you put back into your land more than you're taking out. You're regenerating it. And that is across the spectrum. Birds, wildlife, insects, carbon, water, the whole lot. Because they all need to be there to function in a circle. So if you do your, we've got a five-year rotation, we're probably going to extend it to a sixth in our arable fields. And if at the end of that six-year rotation, there is more of everything, but we've still made food off it. And we're in, we're in Suffolk on kind of grade two land. It's decent land, which I was thinking when you were asking James about, you know, this, the rewilding and nature debate. When we arrived in Suffolk, having spent 10 years in London, pretty much every Guardian article told me that I probably, if I was being morally responsible, we should rewild it. But when you, get, when you, when you start realising that you are making proper tonnage of, of food, it feels, well, it sat very uneasily, which is how I ended up kind of thinking there must be a better way of doing that. And of course, not only is there a better way of doing it, but actually, once you allow your natural systems to regenerate, you don't necessarily take the same kind of penalty that I think people think you do. You're not penalised for ensuring that nature comes back into the middle of the field, which of course has got to be key. We all know about taking bits out of production at the edge. We've done that, bits, the headland bits that never grew stuff. We've put thousands of metres of new hedges in. But I think one of the parts of, the most important part is you can put nature back into the middle of the field where you are growing food. They're not exclusive. In a sentence, how do you do that? Plant flowers. There we go. That will do. Thank you. Um, let's just pick on one element before we move on, uh, just because I get very excited about it, um, which is about hedgerows. Um, because, of course, Take we saw this sorts. huge loss of hedgerows uh, over the last 50 years as hedgerows were scrubbed out to make much larger fields. The logic being that you could get mechanisation in much more easily and obviously free up more land to grow food and so on. But you just mentioned it there. You said you've been putting hedges back, hedgerows back in on your farm. So, you know, that some people might think that means taking land out of production. But actually, you describe in the book this beautiful thing called the hedge effect and actually how it helps produce food. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Hedge edge. Hedge it's edge. even catchier than that, yeah. Well, you can see it. I was shown it on satellite photos apart from anything else. And then I, I too, had sort of been taught. I've just finished a graduate diploma in agriculture at Sirencester. And I, the narrative had always been that there was shading that shaded crops and there would be competition for water underneath if you had a hedge. Apart from the, the very real not being able to get an absolutely massive tractor around tiny dinky fields, which is still a problem. But uh, various farmers introduced me to this a very logical and obvious idea that it's basically a buffer. It's a buffer for wind. 
so that your crops are protected inside it. The roots of your hedge are far deeper than your crop roots, and so they will bring up both different kinds of nutrients, but also hold on to water, which will stop the kind of flooding. We've had the kind of flooding that James has just talked about in Suffolk. I mean, there was a Nissan Micra floating down the high street a few a month ago, and I too drove through the village, and there still giant piles of topsoil, like huge molehills where they've been scraped off the road next to a field that I find very hard not to shout and swear, which I won't because I know that, you know, you've got a dignified grown-up audience, but just plant an effing hedge on the side of the road. So they have so, they have so many kind of multiple benefits, but it's no different, I guess, to a slightly more wild concept, although it was wi so wild when I discovered it that I write about a scene where, in the book where I even say the word agroforestry to someone and he, he explodes in a way that was quite violent. <laughs> but it's now going to be one of the sustainable farming incentive options, which really shows how the landscape has changed, literally and uh, metaphysically, for, for so much. But... You know, I remember going to a farm where Stephen Briggs's farm, who's been doing agroforestry for a long time, and standing in front of his oat field and seeing oats underneath trees, which were higher than the oats in the middle of the field. And he has to adjust his combine boom to get it. Now, that is the opposite of what you think would happen because it would be shaded. But there's something going on the ground that means that there's a symbiosis between the tree plants and what your, your productive crop Connections of the mycorrhizal networks and mycorrhizal fungi and everything. Ab yeah. ab absolutely, and you see it. You can pick any example. We've got a couple of oaks that have just been put into one of the new hedges. They went in a year after the hedge was planted, and they are probably two or three foot taller than the other trees because they were oaks that had been seeded by jays in the field next door that we dug up and replanted. So they are, through mycorrhizal networks, being sent, sent nutrients by the mother oak. It still blows my mind, but... That's a nice one, isn't it? Okay, well, Sarah, thank you very much. And um, uh, that sets you up, uh, you've heard from the panel here, to kick us off. Now it's over to you, our audience in Oxford, if you've got any questions to our panel. And please say who you are and uh, who you're representing or whatever, if you are representing anyone, um, and let the microphone come to you. I'll come first. Uh, Helena was very quick with the microphone. Um, so, uh, yeah... Yeah, yeah, you're thinking it's a number 10, 10 press conference, Helena, but it's not quite. But anyway, go ahead. I'm Helena Horton from The Guardian, and I'm asking you, as we're rightly improving standards here in the UK, are you concerned that the Trade Department is not in line with DEFRA and that they are trying to um, increase um, imports from countries that don't have the same standards and, in fact, have lower than the EU? Um, are you concerned with the cost of living crisis that's going to have an impact, um, particularly as the price gap may, might increase? And should we, second question, um, should we ban the emergency use of neonicotinoids? Thanks. James, let me come to you first on Nature Friendly Farming Network. This is obviously something that, you know, where you're trying to raise standards, you're trying to support nature friendly farming in this country, uh, to be undermined by imports of food through trade deals that is produced to lesser standards must be very frustrating. Uh, yes, it is incredibly frustrating um, and very disappointing given the promises that are always made by governments and never actually come to fruition. Um, but the, but that isn't... Specifically, a, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, Michael Gove stood and said that, you know, yeah. we, we won't undermine our farmers within trade deals and then yeah. the first trade deal they did was exactly that. Um, <laughs> But that isn't any reason for us to lower our standards. Absolutely no reason at all. You know, we should, and not just on a moral issue, but we should, we should farm as best as we can for the environment, for nature, for future sustainability. You know, just because there's some cheap product coming in with lower standards should not mean we should lower our own either. We need support from, you know, retailers, from this whole supply chain, really, to help with that. Um, but we really have to do the best that we can for our own farms, for our, oh, sorry, for our own farming future on that. Um, yeah, and on your second question, um, yes, I think they should. Um, we don't grow sugar beet though, so it's easy for me to say that. Um, but maybe if there is a crop that we want to grow in this country that we can't for whatever reason, um, 
then maybe we should look at growing other crops instead. And with climate change and things, there is an opportunity. And if it's not sustainable to grow sugar beet in this country without using neonicotinoids, then maybe we shouldn't use that. But then we should also look at where neon neonicotinoids are coming from as well in terms in pollution in water, things like um, spot on on dogs and that sort of thing. You know, people really need to know where the neonicotinoid problem is, and it isn't just in agriculture. It is much more widespread than that. So that's a flea treatment for dogs, yeah. 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 So uh, neonics in that as well. And the problem is that then dogs... Goes like my dog, then goes swimming in the watercourse. We don't use that, by the way, but it then goes swimming in the watercourse, and of course, washes the neonics into the watercourse. A lot of people don't know about, so it's a very good point. Lucinda, on this issue of trade deals, I mean, a supermarket like M and S, you know, obviously, we'll we'll constantly be thinking how you secure, you know, huge amounts of uh, food for the future. I mean, what's been your 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 sense of this about, you know, obviously trade deals that result in undermining standards here in the UK? So MNS very am I on? Yeah. MNS very clear. I mean our mantra is British first, best of the rest. And so ultimately all our meat's British and, and we, we, we really much take pride in supporting British farming. So yes, I guess trade deals that do undermine those British farmers we're we're concerned about. Our view is that and we started in Britain with our farming with nature standards because that's been the easiest place to start, but anything we do now source from overseas we're about to roll out our international program so we'll be asking for the same sorts of things and working with safar with farmers overseas so i really i i think if you like with the stance that we've taken around supporting british i'm probably less worried about undermining through imports okay thanks lucinda um steve at the, at the wildlife trust we don't really like neonicotinoids do we uh, so yes, never use them. Uh, you know, incredibly harmful for wildlife. Um, and yeah, I agree with the other panelists that they have, if, if we can't grow our crops sustainably, we can't risk our wildlife. Is the sound alright? Which mics are working? So Steve's isn't working. Steve and Lucinda's a bit. So is alright. Oh, okay. Right. We'll see what happens. This is why we can edit it out, you see. Sorry? It's a signal from the pillars. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. But anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, so, Steve, yeah. So, neo you were saying ne neonicotinoids are incredibly toxic. I mean, one teaspoon of neonicotinoids is famously Dave Gorson, the bee specialists have said it can kill a quarter of a billion bees. Yeah, I mean, neonicotinoids are designed to, to kill wildlife. That's what they do. They're there to protect the plant uh, from, from insect life, and they're incredibly effective at doing it. The, the issue is, is, as always with these products, that the, there's a risk to uh, non-target species, uh, and bees are one of them. So, you know, we, we have a lot of that in, in the protection projects in farming, um, not just in growing uh, beet crops, but you have it in livestock, in the combination of spot-on and flukes and wormers, we know are incredibly disruptive to dung beetles, another part invertebrate in our ecosystem. So, you know, it, it's, it's part of that journey for farmers, I think, when they're looking at that farming system, is about what can they cut out, how can they challenge the, the mindset of what has been done traditionally. And you know, the, the basis of it all is what's the economic value to the business? You know, the, the more things that farmers can stop coming through the farm gate they have to pay for, whether it's plant protection projects, whether it's wormers, whether it's flucicides or insecticides, you know, that's that's less cost to them, it's going to increase their margin. So I think that you need to look for the, the double value, both for the environment and for the business, when making those decisions. Thank you. Sarah, uh, the east, east of England is a big sugar beet producing area. You, you must have heard quite a bit of discussion about this. Yeah. No. Oh, no, I'm back. Uh, I just may congratulate Helena on what we on the trade call leading questions, where there's only yes or no answers. Yeah, there are, it's a big sugar beet area, of course, and I feel the frustrations of farmers who have put a lot of money into growing one of their most lucrative crops, and uh, they fail because there has been a ban, and so the same crops are just imported from a country that is allowed to use what has been banned, um, which of course doesn't really solve the fundamental problem which is that most pesticides are inevitably going to come up against biological resistance 
it's like this great big secret that no one talks about, apart from the fact that on my final module in advanced crop production, not a sentence I ever thought I'd say, um, we had one of the representatives from one of the leading agri-chemical businesses, and I thought, well, I used to cross-examine people for a living. This could be quite fun. And so I asked him, who worked there for 15, has worked there for 15 years, what his R&D said about how long their products last before inevitable natural biological resistance, to which he said between 5 and 15 years. So nature wins in the end. So it's not... I don't... I mean, I don't really like banning stuff just for the sake... But... I think the ed part which is missing from this debate is the education of why increasing use of insecticides is never going to pay in the end, why you're on a losing streak to begin with. So you might get that crop, okay, you might get that crop away, and maybe the one after, one after that, but eventually you will be taken out by something which has become resistant to the product you have used whether it's that or another beetle, a weevil, for example. And that is the part of this debate which I never hear. I never hear that car. I just hear the bit about, which is completely valid, of course, about pollinator losses, which are of critical. I imagine most of the apple growers in Kent, who I think there was a segment on the Farmers Weekly podcast about them losing kind of £5 million pounds of revenue because there just aren't the pollinators to pollinate apples, which is a hundred million pound industry in the UK. So that kind of the argument which is missing from this is always that it's never going to work long term anyway. So f find another solution rather than just banning it. Just go right in at the top. James. Yeah, <laughs> we, need to, we need to support farmers in, in either finding alternative cropping or finding a way mm. to grow the crop that can't do without the indigenous. There's a great, if you get into quite amusing insects, because I looked at this, uh, you can grow, if you grow a buckwheat, then apparently they can't get into, because you, it's just in the beginning bit of the crop, once it's away, it's away. So I have a friend down in Hampshire on a very productive grade one farm who's been trying to grow a buckwheat to literally hide the plant from the beetle. I thought it was quite sweet. Good, thank you. I'm going to come out with some other questions uh, shortly, but just to say, Helen, I, I don't normally do this, but on this, on, on these two points, I feel I should just say where the wildlife trusts are on this. On the, um, just in case you don't know, I'll start with the first one on trade deals. It's worth saying, I think wildlife trusts and all environmental organisations in this country stand shoulder to shoulder actually with the farming groups. We should not be allowing imports of food to produce to lower standards in the UK, environmental standards. That's really clear, and it's been incredibly disappointing how the government has broken their own promises on this issue over the last five years. Um, on the second point about neonicotinoids, it's worth saying, of course we don't like them as the Wildlife Trust because of how toxic they are for, for wildlife and bees and, and other species, birds as well in particular. But I think what is really astonishing about this is, is we're now in the fourth year in a row in which farming organisations or, or food organisations, this year British Sugar, have applied for a derogation, in other words, a temporary unbanning, if you like, of this very toxic uh, pesticide. And they're saying they're doing it for extraordinary reasons. And our view is that when something's happened four years in a row, that's not too extraordinary. Can I ask the okay, how many times did they get it? Uh, they've had it. The government has granted it on many occasions, but then actually it's ended up being... There's been a cold snap after. Yeah, so they, they haven't, haven't ever. It. I think that's so been the interesting been... kind of grey amongst it is that they've applied for it, and there has been an intervention, whether weather or otherwise. So it hasn't actually. So there are the, check, the few the checks and, from us one year. Yeah. As well, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, that's the checks and balance within the system to yeah. an extent. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think it, to, to echo both the point that James and Sarah were saying, you know, um, the, Neo, the British Sugar would say that. Uh, neonics are needed when you have a warm winter and that results in aphids uh, affecting the crop and uh, if you get a cold winter you they would say that you don't need it because it kills off the aphids but in a context of climate change the idea that you have to keep having these emergency derogations because you keep getting warm winters doesn't stack up so uh, just on that 
right, I'm going back into chair roll now. Who, who's got a question? Oh, we've got loads of questions. It's brilliant. Uh, gentlemen at the back, please. If you can just wait for a microphone to come to you, please say who you are. Hi, um, my name's Phil White. Um, I'm a regenerative farmer from South Oxfordshire. I'd uh, just like to thank the panel for a brilliant presentation um, and a really great start questions. Um, I believe passionately about producing good quality, nutrient-dense food that doesn't cost the earth either financially or ecologically. Um, I think that's a basic human right. So how can we make sure that that kind of food is affordable for everyone and not just people who can afford to shop at M&S? In other words, how can we reflect the true cost of food? Very good question. Um, well, Sarah, I'll come back to you on this first, because you do debate this a little bit in the book, don't you? So, so this, and, and you just talk about that, that brilliant line of a chicken that costs less than a pint of beer, which, which certainly got through to me. Um, just, so w tell us a little bit more what your thinking was. There's another good one, which is m milk. Someone told me, a dairy farmer told me that m milk was now cheaper than bottled water, and I didn't believe him until I went home and looked on the Tesco's website. And if you're getting a 500 milliliter bottle, that is true. Um, I think that far cleverer people than I have answered this, because Henry Dimbleby looks at this in his national food strategy, and so did anyone that I have read who's looked at the fallacy behind cheap food and how you make sure that those on the lowest incomes aren't penalised in terms of their health by being forced to eat food which is cheap, is that you subsidise decent food for those on the lowest incomes. That, that has been the recommendation that I've read in report after report after report. And I can't see any better solution than that uh, and I mean like I mean I don't want to just pile into the government because it's easy sport because it is like shooting fish in a barrel at the moment but the the you know why well, I know one of Henry Dimbleby's great frustrations is that they commissioned him to write this national food strategy and then just didn't action any of the recommendations that he ended up making but that is that's one of the most obvious ones and of course it's we can tie this up in short-term thinking and long-term thinking, which is that an upfront payment to subsidise uh, good quality food for those on the lowest incomes, of course, is kinder on the public purse in 10, 15 years' time. Because we all know, well, maybe, maybe well, I only know because I'm a massive geek and I looked it all up online, but they are good at publishing statistics, our government. And I know that our costs, our NHS cost on diabetes treatment alone... 90% of which is diet-related diabetes, is exactly the same amount of money per year as we spend on our entire legal system. Courts, judges, probation, legal aid, which is now means-tested, uh, prisons. So that is a cost which none of us can afford to pay, let alone the people who are suffering from it. So I would just say, you know, what Henry said. Thanks so much. Um, so, James, do you want to come in on this? I mean, you know, Nature Friendly Farming Network, obviously promoting Nature Friendly Farming, but some people would say, yes, but what about the cost, in particular cost of living crisis? Um, I think food waste is a good place to start, really. Um, is it bread? Is it 40% of all bread baked gets thrown thrown away? Um, we're all guilty of it. You know, you have... You buy more bread and it's all uh, in the in the cupboard and it goes off. And um, so, f food waste for one is, is 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 huge, isn't it? And that's from everything. That's from producing the field by and and discarded through standards that are potentially too um, too stringent. So you know, wonky carrots and dirty potatoes or whatever. Um, so that's that's all the, that's all the supply chain thing, isn't it? Really, that that needs to look at that. And I think if if you could sort that, we would have whatever have plenty of food, wouldn't we, to, to eat for starters? But then we would, um, you know, food would be cheaper anyways for starters. Then. Go on, Sarah. Quickly. Sorry, I don't want to monopolise the entire thing. But uh, what I think, you know, M and S and other retailers play a massive could can play a massive role, especially in the food waste thing, because of, of the power of kind of marketing, advertising, as Lucinda said, telling the stories. And we all think that we're all independently minded and that we make our own choices when, of course, we don't. Choices 
a fantasy. And the brilliant example of this is when Transport for London banned advertising on the tube in 2018, 2019 of high sugar, salt and fat products. And looking at two million um, products bought, confectionery and sweets fell by 20%. And a thousand fewer calories in those who were advertised to or weren't advertised to on Transport for London were, in everyone's were missing from everyone's shopping basket. So the, what we see when we go food shopping has a massive influence on our choice. So wonky carrots and how we deal with sell-by dates and it, it's a huge part of this, a huge part of food cost. Lucinda, I mean, obviously, m and has part of your plan A is looking at tackling food waste and so on in the supply chain and, and beyond. And do, do you want to just say anything on that and also about this issue about cost for consumers? Sure. So maybe I take the cost for consumers piece first. So I would say as well that we've done it, we, for example, I'm not sure that all sustainable food has to be more expensive. So we've invested a lot in our slower grown chicken. So we, we now have a, our, all our fresh oakum gold chicken. Or fresh, fresh chicken is oakum gold, which means it's grown for longer. It's a it's a, um, a slower growing bird, if you like. It's, we've invested a lot in it, but you can go into those stores and actually it was, became a TikTok phenomenon last year where, you know, people going into, my goodness, look, this is m and food. At, I can afford it. And it was all over TikTok last year. We did a brilliant job with value and on making people understand that, you know, you can buy sustainable, good quality food. It doesn't have to cost the earth. So I think that to do the cost of living point hopefully is an illustration. But coming back to the point about food waste, the reality of food waste is I think it's like nine and a half, I looked at the stats earlier, nine and a half million tons of food being thrown away every year in this country. The vast majority of that is happening in the home. To your point, it's about bread, it's about potatoes, it's that mouldy potato you've got sitting in the bottom of the fridge. We've done a lot with best before dates. We've taken them off fruit and veg to allow people to sort of use their common sense. We've taken them off milk. We have them. We have dates on the products. We can rotate them in store, but the reality is customers don't see those as dates. We see them as rotational. Um, we, they're called Julian codes instead. But um, the idea is that customers can use their their own common sense. And I think that is working. We have, you know, obviously, it's relatively early days and we'll, we'll be seeing how that, that does manifest. Um, the other point, I think, is is helping people plan their meals. And so one of the things we've done with Tom Kerridge is, is have a series of meal, meal planners, which will be, um, you know, you can buy this, it will cost you this, to your point about cost of living. This is how you make this amount of food go for the week. And it's M&S food, but it, it, and, and you won't waste anything. And I think that, that probably is, is a huge part of it. Thank you very much. Well, we had a lot of questions, hands up just now, so let's get back out. Yeah, uh, there's a lady here in the third row. Again, if you can just say who you are, please. Um, Rebecca Lawton from Land Workers Alliance. In a society where people seem to need really simple answers, how can we communicate better the complexities of something like um, it actually being all right to eat meat and it can be really helpful to wildlife? Okay, thank you. Um, so, Steve, you were talking before about livestock uh, that you have at Bee Bout uh, and so on. Um, and obviously there's this whole debate about meat-eating, not meat-eating, all of those kind of things. Um, but actually, when is, when is meat good meat, in inverted commas, from a, from a wildlife point of view? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. And I'll probably draw on my experience when I was at Surrey Wildlife Trust and we were running a, a large conservation grazing herd. So we, we kept up to 400 Belta Galloway cattle and all of those cattle had a job for conservation. The only reason every single one was kept and it delivered an ecological purpose for that. Um, we, behind that, we had a farming system. We had a home farm, which we we're, were using for regenerative agriculture as well. Um, but out of that, the, let's say the byproduct from delivering those ecological outcomes was a sustainable meat product from that. And this was grazing off heathland, chalk grassland, places that had been given up by agriculture. What was fascinating, and, and we developed over five or six years, was the demand for this meat. First of all, we got approached by a local butcher who was just out of London, set up his own business, found us on, on Google, saw our belt of Galloway's and said, I want some of those. Uh, what followed was nothing that I can claim credit for, um, was the butcher took the product. We were um, slaughtering animals at 36, 48 months when they were ready to go to, to the abattoir. Uh, we were having no inputs in apart from conserved forage. Uh, and then he was selling that locally at a premium and we were charging a premium for that product. 
Um, he had an Instagram account, other butchers follow other butchers, other butchers see the meat, they then start ringing me up. And very quickly, we were supplying seven butchers across Surrey and out of London with a premium product and charging for it. So, and what, every single one of those butchers came to our farms, came to our nature reserves for at least half a day, they came with their wives, their families, and what they were selling was the backstory. They could sell the product, it looked different on the shelf, but what they were selling about the, the, was the story about how these animals had lived a life where they were delivering ecological outputs uh, for, the ben for the benefit of the countryside. And that people might then be eating that as a, as a uh, sort of treat as opposed to part of the regular, you know, eating meat many, many times a week or every day. Yeah, it, it doesn't address at all the, the, the premium price in then for and the accessibility of that really healthy product. And we talk about nutrient density, as, as farmer mentioned before, slow growing meat, growing off heather, growing off, you know, um, permanent grassland you know, grazing multi-species um, plants across the landscape and animals that have choices. You know, they're not just eating perennial eyegrass in a field. It's like you trying to eat chips every day. I, I'll try, but, you know, it, you, you get bored of it pretty quickly. It sounds like a good idea to some. Um, you know, but, you know, when you've got animals that can select dozens and dozens of uh, plant species, can select based on their nutrient requirements and, you know, and self-medicate, all of that gets passed into that. The, the issue is that that is a high quality product and how do we make that accessible to all of society evenly, which I'm not sure I have the answer for. Yeah, this is a complex area, isn't it? There's big issues about support for smaller abattoirs. There's issues, I mean, another one is about uh, wild venison, for example, you know, huge deer populations in parts of this country. And yet, most of the time, and you, if you go into supermarkets, if you do find venison, it's farmed venison, which sort of seems a bit bizarre in the context of huge deer populations. So there's, there's a lot to explore here on this yeah, issue. If I just jump on, on, the, on the venison front, you, we, we produce a bee boat. Our ecology have done for the last 15 years, uh, effectively our own internal state of nature report. And one of the biggest negative ecological impacts on our woodlands is our deer population. During COVID, uh, I was running that re uh, rewilding project in Surrey where we had 160 red deer for ecological purposes. We could not shift venison. We could not get of it. The abattoirs wouldn't take it. The game deers wouldn't take it. Most of our venison gets exported. Ironically, we import loads of venison from New Zealand and Poland and Ireland, and then we export loads to the continent. It's, it's kind of this really weird setup. But, you know, you've got, again, a... a a product that's you know, benefiting the environment by removing that pressure out of the environment. You've got nutrient-dense meat, very healthy, low in fat, and again, we, we couldn't shift it. Uh, small abattoirs and game dealers and support for those are really critical at a local level. Low in carbon than farmed meat, yeah. Um, Lucina, do you want to say anything on this? This is a huge area. And yeah, I mean, I think I think from our, from our perspective, obviously meat is people come to us for brilliant quality meat and which I'm increasingly our, our perspective has been to try and make that meat low carbon so really working with our suppliers across the board to to develop if you like roadmaps for carbon reduction actually what we're seeing coming through from our supply chain is some really interesting reduction carbon reduction related because I think this is the main issue it's about carbon um carbon reduction sort of plans that are coming through and actually keep us on track for net zero so I'm, I'm sort of very supportive of those at the same time obviously it is about innovation and brilliant plant-based innovation but what's quite quite interesting and quite interesting um fact that i i was sort of amazed by really is that it's not that vegan products are sort of taking off in comparison it's that you know we actually have an oat milk right and it was we blend it branded it in our, in our plant kitchen range um which is a sort of blue packaging we then rebranded it and put the, and, it, and put the plant kitchen logo in the side and just as quite small um, in comparison, and the sales went up by 35%. No change in product, we just took it out of the vegan branding. So I think there's a sort of element of customers trying to rebalance and trying to do what they, you know, I think sort of helping people, but I think the vegan, the, the totally vegan product range is not necessarily always as attractive as maybe we may be led to believe. Interesting, isn't it? All right, more questions. Uh, yeah, we have... Um, a lady in the middle, well, we have three hands, some three ladies in the middle. Uh, but Barnaby, if you can get to, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Rosedale and I farm um, grass-fed beef and sheep. And I wanted to ask whether, Lucinda particularly actually, whether you are considering a grass-fed ruminant meat range because of the benefits to wildlife and the fact that they are so low carbon and it's not wasting um, land growing feed crops which are inefficiently fed to livestock. And also, I mean, I'd like to point out the big distinction between different types of British beef, which obviously have hugely different 
ripple effects. Where do you farm those? Um, Buckinghamshire. Okay, thank you. So just to set this up, 40% of edible crops grown in the UK are fed to animals. should know. Uh, so obviously grass-fed meat, uh, where uh, the animals can eat for themselves, as it were, rather than be fed crops grown on other farms or uh, other bits of land, obviously have a, a much reduced uh, impact on other areas and, and help deliver food security, many would argue, uh, and have other benefits as well. Um, Lucinda, what can you, can you do, what are you doing to help those sort of grass-fed uh, meat producers? Well, the vast majority of our beef will spend, at some, send, spend some time on grass as it is. Um, so it's not that we don't, we, we, we don't just do, we don't, vast, vast majority is quite extensively grown anyway. So I don't think we'd be producing a new range. I don't want to speak to my commercial colleagues here, but um, that's not, but we, I think we'll take a, I, it's not currently on the on the pad for a, a range, if you like, but it, the vast majority of our beef will be extensively reared anyway, if that helps. Sorry, you need, need a microphone if we're going to, and particularly for the... I think there is a distinction um, in pure grass-fed partly for human health benefits, also lack of tillage, lack of use of diesel growing the crop, um, capturing carbon in the soil. It's a very low carbon way of producing you know, rich protein and fats for human consumption. And that, of course, means there's more land freed up to produce more affordable other crops for everybody. James, is this something you've looked at, particularly the Nature Friendly Farming Network? Well, on a personal level, we, um, well, we've been organic for nearly 20 years now, I think. I really should have written the date down when we did it, but I always say about 20 years, but that's been the same for the last few years. Um, we, um, it was around that time, I forget when it was, when Plan A was, was it uh, seven, yeah. Um, and one of the ori original aims was all dairy or all liquid milk, was it, to be organic, I think, originally. And that was pulled a few years after that. And I, But when that... When that was announced, it was a few years into our conversion. I was over the moon because I thought it would. The, the, if, if there's something on the shelf um, and there's an opportunity for people, for people to buy it, then they will buy it. Once once it becomes very marginalised on that shelf or it's hidden or whatever, then you know people soon lose interest um, in in that product. Organic at the moment, organic milk is going through quite a bit of a sort of a stressful period, really, um, and that's because it's been given less shelf space at the moment. Um, so the more opportunity there is to buy something, and if that is pasture for life beef, um, which there is a standard, I think, for pasture for life anyway, so that could be quite easy done. If, if there's an opportunity there for people to buy it, then people will buy it and it will grow. And the only, the only reason it can, the only way it can grow is if there's an opportunity for people to actually buy it. So I think for a supermarket or a major retailer to actually engage with that, I think that would be a fantastic thing. Great, thank you. Let's let's go back out. Uh, next question, please. Yeah, gentleman back there on the left. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Robbie Maynard. I don't really represent anybody. Um, I'm really looking for your personal perspectives because it's been a great panel and really informed and you're all doing pragmatic, regenerative things. Very briefly, I had a word with the gardener in the college that I'm staying at and I he asked me why I was here. I said, I was here for the conference. And I said, oh, I love what you're doing in the garden. And he then started talking about resilience and regeneration. And actually, his conclusion was that everything he was doing was probably worthless because the college authorities wanted to build everything they could and they wanted to maximize profit. And his passing, parting words, slightly depressingly, were, I think we're all screwed. <laughs> We've just got I think you better not quickly. say where you're staying. We no, apologize. No. You might get him in trouble. Exactly. Anyway. Just around the corner. So we've just got through COP28. We've burnt more fossil fuels than ever before and emitted more greenhouse gas emissions. You, Craig, and the excellent Wildlife Trust and the RPB have produced the reports for the past I put, four or five years. Most nature-depleted country in the world. Our population is growing. We're 8 billion as of last year, heading to 10 billion, possibly 12 billion. World Bank says we've got a 56% food gaps. So my question is, it seems to me that what you're doing is, in terms of resilience and regeneration is preparing for what happens after the collapse. Because we're not hit, we, we, we know 1.5 is off the cards, so is 2. 
If you read IPCC, it's more like three degrees. So you're, you're building the arc. Why can't you communicate more about what is coming to pass? Because it's not all pretty. Sarah, do you want to go with that? Your communicator. Thanks. So there you go. I don't know that I agree with all of your statistics. There was a really interesting talk at the Oxford Farming Conference last year about uh, 10 billion being accepted as the plateau. And uh, the food gap is, of course, met in some respects by food waste. And But I'll leave that aside. Um, I, if, if I've understood the questions, like how we better communicate the fact that we're all on a kind of burning ship. Well, I don't think that you can get any solution across without hope being in it because people just shut down. And if you paint splatter them with disaster statistics, they'll just go and watch Selling Sunset or something. Although, interestingly, as a viewer of Selling Sunset, they can't get fire insurance in any of their houses because California's on fire. So that's a message subverted in there. But the we don't we are going to the point about nuance earlier i think i i personally well i would say this i'm a writer but i think that we understand the world through stories better than statistics and posters and i think that we need to be slightly cleverer about how we interweave those messages into daily life more by which i mean i, I genuinely do mean stuff on telly and normalizing uh Oh, for on the most basic stuff, recycling, not flying. Um, w w the power of our chefs is enormous. We talked, uh, in 20 years ago, there was the Delia effect where she managed to get people to buy medium eggs because she put it in her recipes, changing it from large eggs. Sainsbury's would say that their shells would sell out the day after she'd done a TV programme. So I think that we get over the problem of nuance and we get over, uh, we get the message across by weaving it into normal life and that involves what we're all sold the whole time the crossing the floor to talk to the people that advertise to us and market to us and what's on telly rather than sitting on the outside pointing fingers thank you um just we've got less than 10 minutes left so i'm just going to get out and try and get a few more questions someone else uh yeah gentleman here in the red jumper yeah okay and then I'll be heading to the back bar after this. Does that work? Yeah. Yes, brief, great. Brief question, please. Very quick, right? George Brownie, I'm an organic farmer in Warwickshire. I'm very pleased that we've got an organic farmer on the panel as well. And I know we've got another couple of the audience. Two. <laughs> yeah. Well, two. Great. Join the club. Um, I, you mentioned about small abattoirs. I was horrified only the other day to discover that my nearest small abattoir is closing at the end of the month. Um, so all these th things that we've heard are great, but... We need, I think, to connect people far more into their local supply. We need to make sure we don't lose any more small abattoirs. So what can we, I mean, it links into what you've just been saying, really, about publicity. But I think, I wonder if the message is right. Can we get a message that actually gets through to everybody that they need to be going back to basics as far as what they're going to eat? Steve, Steve's keen. Yeah. Revving up on this yeah, one. It... Yeah, I think oh, you're right. So keen. I think you are. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was really interesting. This was a, a huge problem for us at the Wildlife Trust, how far we had to transport our animals and what type of animals uh, they would take. So fur on in terms of the uh, of game dealers. Um, so we fed in actually as a part of consultation response, I think it was coordinated by Newcastle University, probably 2019, 20, just before COVID, about um, small abattoirs and the requirements for small abattoirs. I was pleased to see that DEFA announced capital grant funding for small abattoirs, I think, just before Christmas. Um, they are essential. Uh, the most, a lot of abattoirs don't make a huge margin. A lot of them are on tenancies. A lot of them really struggle to invest in uh, infrastructure and equipment. So I think capital grants from DEFA, uh, from the public purse, are essential to ensure that there's local meat and local supply chain, uh, but also, you know, that animal welfare standards are as good as they possibly can be, and transparency is completely in there. In that consultation, I, I did ask for them to be actually nationalised and franchised out, because I thought that was a better way of uh, making standards uh, um, and allowing them to be operated. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, question at the back, I think, is someone's been waiting patiently. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's Chris. Hello. Hello, Chris. 
Uh, thanks, Greg. I, uh, Chris Jones, I'm a farmer from Cornwall and I've been involved in this sort of sphere for 20 plus years now. Um, now, is it too much for us, the farmers and society in general, to think of the food that we eat as a byproduct of a really healthy ecosystem if we're going to persist as a species? Ooh. James, you look keen on that one. <laughs> yeah, someone, uh, well, it's actually it was Jake Fine said that to me about three years ago. Um, that you will, that you will, <laughs> uh, you've probably got it from you then, yeah. He, um, yeah, um, and I hadn't thought about it like that at all. But we, we at home at Strictly, we do, we see everything we do on the farm as, you know, as they all have an equal stake. So be it the water quality and the, you know, the fish in the back or it be the, the hedges uh, or the milk or the cows or whatever, they all have a very much equal stake and nothing gets priority over the other. We still need to make a business. We still need to survive financially. Um, but we, you know, everything has an equal importance. Um, so, yes, I wouldn't want one to go above the other, really. I think if we can just, just keep them all in the same basket, as it were, I think that, that would be a much more sustainable way of looking at it. Chris, now that I've realised who, uh, who, who who's asking the question, I'm going to ask a question to you, if I can, uh, cheekily, and you can make it clear why I've obviously asked you this question. We had, we had many, many questions came in advance, but we've had so many hands here tonight, I've gone mostly with the hands in the room. But we did have one question in advance from a Lloyd Glanville, who said, what does the data show about the impact of beaver rewilding on agriculture? Chris, maybe you'd like to explain why I've asked you that. And, um, and, and tell me, what does the data show about the impact of beaver rewilding on agriculture? Um, I think what it shows is that if we want to have beavers uh, in very flat landscapes with large, slow-moving bodies of water amongst very fertile land, so clearly I'm describing the lower Tay and the fens, we need to be prepared for a shitstorm. Um, because beavers, just doing normal beaver stuff, will burrow through banks and flood uh, big areas of, of potentially uh, uh, fertile land. Now, that's fine if uh, government or whoever is prepared to stump up of the losses. There's no sign of that happening in Scotland, uh, and I know the EFRA committee went to Germany and looked how it works there. It doesn't have to be terribly expensive, but there has to be a commitment from government to make that happen. In the meantime, uh, probably three quarters of our waterways, maybe more, would accommodate beavers from source to sea where there being really low risk of conflict and with a host of benefits going with that. And, it and was... what are the kind of benefits? <clears throat> Okay, be beaver impacts can work really well uh, to reduce flood risk. They certainly work very well to reduce the uh, impact of drought. They are amazing at cleaning up waterways, uh, certainly in headwaters. And of course, the, uh, the biodiversity benefits are, I would say, almost incalculable. Um, you know, we've just seen stuff going like this, Hitler salute, uh, uh, since we've had them in our place. They've only been there six years, but everything is just bouncing. Um, so there's, there's no doubt in my mind about that. But we've got to remember, anything we do in the environment is on somebody's land. And most of that land belongs to farmers. Mm -hmm. And if I was farming uh, you know, high-value crops in the fens, I'd be pretty pissed off if someone introduced beavers there uh, without at least a guarantee that losses were going to be covered. Uh, so um, I think that's probably enough in an okay. on that. We, ca we ought to have a strategy. Who's coming up with it? Government isn't. DEFRA isn't. I've asked the NFU, who I'm quite pally with these days, bizarrely. Uh, I've asked the NFU to come up with a strategy. I'm told well, it's not our job to. Um, I, I, I just wonder who is going to come up with a strategy that we can feed into government if they're not prepared to make up one of their own. Okay, thank you. And of course, I asked you because Cornwall Beaver Project is on your farm. Yeah, that's just so that people understand. Um, just in context, that so you said three quarters of the waterways you think it w would work with very minimal negative impact. My cuff. Okay, jolly good. Um, and we should say this is in a context where uh, an area half the size of the Lake District is given over to bioenergy crops, 
um, I would say with very dubious climate benefits. Uh, let's have another question. Uh, this might be one of the last questions. Lady in the, in the which, whichever one you can get to, I'm afraid, Barnaby. <laughs> So that's, at least that's a sort of fairly fair way of doing it. Thank you. Um, this is not my fault. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah Wakefield from uh, the Eating Better Alliance. Thank you for your panel. In what we anticipate to be a general election year, uh, what is top of the panel's policy wish list for whomever gets into government? Oh, what a very good question. Um, it might even be the one that I was planning um, to finish us off. Um, James. I would like the government, um, whoever it may be, to um, to build on the ambition that was uh, initially spoken of um, with the agricultural transition, however many years ago it was once we left um, the EU. Um, the aims then were quite bold, um, you know, public money, public goods, uh, green transition, um, and it all seemed rosy, but uh, it's been stepped back and stepped back uh, with every announcement since and watered down and become a, quite a broad and shallow um, approach. So I would like the government, whoever it may be, to really build on that initial promise and take it forward and see this nature versus food as something that doesn't happen. You know, we, want, we want nature and food together and this absolutely can, can be produced together successfully on both on farms. Great. Thank you, James. Lucinda? We've been calling for a while for um, clarity for farmers um, around ELMS, around the next modules, around what's coming up. So ELMS are the environmental land management yeah. schemes, the, the, the farming exactly. uh, payments to support so nature and environment. Yeah, so farmers ultimately, small businesses, can make decisions with the full range of options in front of them. Um, I think that's definitely our big one. And then obviously EU deforestation regulation and the announcement around a UK regulation. Um, let it, let's get that. Let's get that done but done well and pragmatically that would be our big push to stop the import of products that might be associated with deforestation yeah, exactly. like unsustainable palm oil and so on aligned with the eu that already yeah. has regulation but making sure that the way we implement these these policies is aligned lucinda thank you steve uh, yeah, more money for Elms, more money for nature, uh, quite simply. Uh, some of the payment rates, uh, as James just said, have been you know, dis disappointingly low to aid that transition for farmers. Um, if, you know, low input grassland is about 150 odd pounds a, a hectare. Uh, maintenance of species risk grassland, GS6, I think is 180 pounds a hectare. So rewarding good farmers for maintaining existing habitats, I think is important. But we've really got to up the scale and the amount of money and the ambition. What has been heartening is to see how the landscape recovery scheme has taken off and how, how many of those landscape recovery schemes have been led by farmers and farmer clusters with nature at the foremost. So more money for landscape recovery, more money for farmers to lead on landscape recovery uh, and more money in that agricultural budget. Okay, Steve, thank you. Sarah? I realise this is optimistic, but I would get them to merge DEFRA and the Department for Health. <laughs> <laughs> On the basis that Lady Eve Balfour, who co-founded the Soil Association, said five years before the formation of the NHS, if there is to be a national health service, it should be agriculture. So, Sarah, I recommend you and the audience, both here and online, to uh, Google, Google the Wildlife Trust Natural Health Service, which we published summer last year, which is a slightly different angle, but looked at all the... The NHS has these pilot projects across England at the moment, looking at how they can do green prescribing. So, if you, if you look at it this way, in Canada, for example, doctors can prescribe people uh, free membership of national parks... Uh, as opposed to giving them pills for anxiety and so on. And so uh, Wildlife Trust are engaged in all the pilots that the NHS are currently doing about how doctors can prescribe uh, people time in nature on Wildlife Trust programmes to help deal with health, well-being, anxiety, mobility issues and so on. And in that report we published last summer, Natural Health Service, um, it showed that actually if you scaled up all the programmes we're running across the Wildlife Trust, all those pilots, across just England alone, it would deliver better health outcomes and save the NHS £600 million a year. So we do hope that the, the uh, different political parties will look at that closely in the run-up to the election. OK, so final question uh, to you all from me, if we can. If all this stuff is farming with nature and farming in a way that restores nature... 
nature-friendly farming, regenerative agriculture, if it's such an obviously good thing to do, why isn't it happening everywhere? And what needs to be done to really scale it up? James. I think it is happening everywhere. We're just in small pockets. And it's really building. You know, like this... Um, it's going to take a momentum. It's going to be like a snowball effect, really. And then once there's, there's, there's enough people doing it, then it will become the norm. At the moment, it is seen as a, being a bit of an outsider, if you're doing that. But, you know, those pockets will spread and it will, and it will become the norm. Thank you. Lucinda? Well, I agree. And I think, so for my sins, I'm also married to a farmer. And he, he said to me recently, I said, um, I think... We used to, you know, we have agronomists. Everyone's had agronomists for ages. But actually, what we all need now is ecologists. And I think that's how we scale it. By having, instead of an agronomist on farm, we need an ecologist as well, or an agroecologist, or whatever it is, to give the advice. I think the reality is everyone wants to do it. I've not met a farmer that doesn't want to do this. It's just a question of knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And if we can give people that advice, I think they'll do it. Great, thank you. Steve? Uh, I think farming needs leadership, and I think it needs some, uh, some honest messages about the challenges it's facing. And I think it needs the information that the challenges it's facing through climate, through externalities of the market, are not going to be solved by agrochemicals or the plough. Um, and I think you, some of the best examples of the most progressive farming is through knowledge sharing and farmer clusters coming together to share best practice and to show that these methods make farm businesses more profitable. Because at the end of the day, for this to be sustainable, it's got to fit the farm business, it's got to work for the farmer um, in that context. So knowledge sharing uh, and showing that the produce benefits the farm's profitability. Thank you. Sarah? I think because this is as much about psychology as it is about ecology and change is really, really hard. And you change either because you have to, because there's no other option, or, or because all your mates are. And we're now in the position where both of those are true. We can't... <laughs> Literally... <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> as they are anyway but also brilliant roadside farming which we all do all the time shows you that change is happening in fields you can see it happening in fields and farmer clusters I've um, we started the farmer cluster and steering group for that that's a brilliant way of doing it but the psychology behind this is absolutely part of it because it is hard and it involves not just relearning but learning new stuff that no one's ever told you uh, I mean, even Martin Lyons sitting in the front here is now terrified. Uh, I remember going to Martin's farm, God, what, five years ago, and you said, as we walked through this incredible field where everything kind of rose up around you, and you turned to me with a massive grin, said, I could not have told you what any of these birds were. I couldn't have told you. And no one ever told me. I couldn't have told you what any of these birds were. And now I know. So there is a, um, a knowledge gap, but change is really, really hard, and I think we need to look at it as a psychological project as much as anything else. Which actually also, <laughs> which actually also means that you reach a tipping point because when, when all your mates are doing it, then you're more likely to do it as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we wrap up, please give this brilliant panel a big round of applause. So I thought I'd finish with this uh, little nugget for you that has been buried away in a government report, and it's far too buried away. In 2021, DEFRA published the UK Food Security Report, which identified two things as the greatest threats to food security in the UK in the medium to long term. Can you guess what they were? Biodiversity loss and climate change. Interesting, isn't it? You don't hear that very much. Anyway, if you've enjoyed tonight, uh, please uh, do make sure you go over to the Wildlife Trust YouTube page where you'll see huge numbers of wild lives uh, from the last two, three years on a vast range of topics uh, and make sure you can enjoy them and, and you can sit there and binge watch them all if you want, if you really, really want to. Um, and so make sure you do that. Also, make sure you subscribe to the Wildlife Trust social media channels because we've got many more wild lives planned this year. And we're planning something particularly exciting at Groundswell, the Regenerative Farming Festival, this summer. So make sure you follow for that for details of that. Uh, and also follow Wildlife Trust YouTube channels and social media for all kinds of announcements over the next 24, 48 hours as we respond to things that are being said here 
in Oxford. Um, and uh, But we just want to finish from where I am to say huge thanks to our panel, to James, Lucinda, to Steve, and to Sarah. It's been a really good discussion tonight. We hope that we have put the food versus nature debate to bed, at least for you here in the audience here tonight. We cannot possibly uh, have food for the future if we don't have nature for the future. Nature underpins all our food production, everything we need for a healthy society and for well-being in the long term. If we restore nature, we restore our food production and we restore humanity too. From Oxford, thank you very much for joining us and good night. Thank you.